Thank you to my Asbantium level patron Fallon Cortez for helping to support the channel. What's the biggest bank heist you can think of? Maybe the Northern Bank Heist in Ireland, where £26.5 million were stolen in December 2004. Or maybe you think about the huge $97 million Knightsbridge security deposit robbery of 1987. Perhaps it's the Central Bank of Iraq heist in 2003, where Saddam Hussein's son made off of a whopping $1 billion, but the scale of all of these robberies pale in comparison to that of the Bank of Karabraxos in Doctor Who's Time Heist, where the main character is roped into a heist of the most secure bank in the entire universe. There are evil villains, high-tech gadgets, and a lot of time shenanigans, because of course there are, this is Doctor Who after all. I've always enjoyed heist movies, they're really fun and creative, so Time Heist has a lot to live up to. Does it serve as a nice love letter to the popular genre, or does it feel a bit too generic and familiar for its own good? Well, as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So grab your closest memory worm and try to avoid your brain becoming soup, because it's time to take a deep dive into Time Heist. Director Calabraxos, excuse us, but we've come to rob you. Even before he began to plan out Series 8 of Doctor Who, showrunner Stephen Moffat had toyed with the idea of combining time travel with the iconic heist genre, which had regained popularity with things like the Oceans trilogy, the Italian Job remake, and of course, the incredible BBC show Hustle, which had run from 2004 to 2012 and shared a lot of cast and crew with Doctor Who, with writers like Matthew Graham, directors like James Strong and Colin Teague, along with actors like John Barrowman and Mark Warren, who was famous for playing the world's only man in a sexual relationship with a paving slab. Anyway, it's safe to say that the high genre was alive and thriving around the time Doctor Who Series 8 was being planned out. So Stephen Moffat approached writer Steve Thompson to develop an episode about the Doctor and Clara robbing an outer space bank in classic Doctor Who fashion. It's also important to note that Thompson had worked on Sherlock with Moffat, so he was familiar with writing the complex puzzle box narratives Moffat was keen to feature in Time Heist. Thompson was well aware that a story like this would inevitably be compared to other examples of heist media, so he basically decided to consciously lean into the cliches and expectations the viewer would have. And I think this is an admirable goal, because whilst tropes and cliches can be overly familiar, their mere presence alone is never enough to devalue a story. If your story is filled with cliches, it's okay as long as it's an actually good story, with a tight script that justifies all the tropes. And I think Time Heist achieves this wonderfully. Good. This is a good day to be a bank robber. It plays all the hits you expect from a heist movie, but it still feels like its own thing, something creative and new. I mean, a big clue is in the title itself. It's not just a heist, it's a time heist. Indeed, this episode uses its Doctor Who nature as a big strength to make it unique. We get fancier gadgets than other heist movies because by being in space and the future, the protagonists are granted access to special devices to escape rooms and teleportation devices under the guise of being like cyanide pills. This makes it unique compared to the contemporary heist narratives we're so very used to, because it's able to do these new things, perfectly blending the heist and sci-fi genres by combining the best of both worlds. The look and feel of the episode is delightfully slick and perfectly aligns with what we know from the heist genre. Director Douglas McKinnon said in an interview that he's watched virtually every heist movie ever, and this really shows with the quality of time heist directing. From stylish transitions to slow motion scenes, there is just so much finesse and passion within the look of the episode. It's clear that McKinnon loved working on time heist with all his homages to heist and spy media. Hell, the incredible directing even lends a lot of variation to how corridor-centric the episode can sometimes be, with a lot of generic locations made unique and varied thanks to directing and lighting. There are plenty of angles, and in general, the world is fleshed out wonderfully. This is the Bank of Karabraxos, the most secure bank in the galaxy. I love this idea of an alien bank with all these high-tech security systems. It makes things so futuristic, yet things like the vault and safety deposit boxes keep everything very familiar and what we know of banks. 
The Doctor Who universe is incredibly vast and it's delightful to see things which are more mundane than normal, such as banks. It's not some fancy alien army base or a secret science lab, it's just a bank for the super rich located on another planet. There's also a nice bit of acknowledgement of the wider universe, as we see easter eggs of other Doctor Who characters and monsters, including Absalom Dax, some obscure Doctor Who comic character. Sai hacks into a database of thieves, treating us to sense Ice Warriors, Slitheen, Weevils and Terraptals. Monsters from across the show's history we recognise and know are common throughout the universe and up to no good. However, we also get to see specific named characters like Carla Tech from A Town Called Mercy, Captain John Hart from Torchwood, The Trickster and Andrevax the Veil from Sarah Jane Adventures. All of these characters are dastardly villains whose presence on a criminal database feels very warranted and logical. We know many of their crimes and are familiar with them as rogues, so why wouldn't the rest of the universe know about them? It's such a small touch, but it creates such a realistic feeling of infamy and helps to connect this episode to the wider Doctor Who ecosystem by showing us just how connected this universe really is. Time Heist is a delightful example of how flexible Doctor Who is when it comes to genres. Sure, the general shell of the narrative is the stereotypical bank heist you get from Mission Impossible or the Oceans movies, but it doesn't try to compete with these productions. The team behind the episode knew they didn't have the budget or the slick Hollywood style to go up against these shining examples. So instead, they made Time Heist special and interesting in its own way because of its incredible twist on the heist formula. Indeed, this particular episode is fascinating because the main characters don't even know why they're doing this. It's a delightful twist, robbers breaking into a bank without even knowing what they're meant to be stealing. This intriguing mystery is established in a wonderful scene at the beginning as the soon-to-be heist crew find their memories erased with those memory worms from the snowmen. I love the atmosphere in this scene everything feels so tense and confusing. For once, the characters are just as in the dark as the viewers are, as they try to unravel why they're here, or why they agree to work with this strange and mysterious architect, a shadowy figure tasking them with such a dangerous and seemingly impossible mission. This sequence is such a great cold open, especially as the characters' own voice recordings affirm their participation, a chilling reminder of just how important memory is. Although, given today's technology, we can't really try trust something like this anymore. Nevertheless, Capaldi's take on the Doctor really sells the weight and gravity of the moment, with 12's reaction perfectly communicating the shock and confusion of finding himself in this scenario. He's lost and confused, having to answer to a higher power, which he hates doing, but he has no choice. Joining the Doctor and Clara in this heist crew are the supporting characters Cybra and Sai, who are strong elements of the story. Obviously, they play good roles in the usual heist team trope, with the master of disguise and the hacking tech expert, but there's also a lot of depth to them as characters. The episode gives them sympathetic backstories, such as Sai's tragic past of being forced to delete memories of his loved ones to protect them when he was arrested. Even though he's a career criminal, a backstory like this makes Sai much more of a protagonist, someone fleshed out and worth caring about because he has this profound sense of loneliness and emptiness. You deleted your friends? My friends, anyone who ever helped me, my family. Imagine not even knowing the faces of your parents, having no memories of any of your birthdays or, I don't know, learning to ride a bike. Sai lost all of these fundamental human memories along with the experiences of friends and past romances. It's a really horrible thing for a character to have to go through, losing so much of his own identity. He may have cybernetic implants, but losing his own memories is what truly takes away his feeling of humanity. It is a shame that Sai is pretty much the least developed of the four robbers. I suppose this is just because there's less to him as a person beyond this sympathetic origin story. He's just kind of a run-of-the-mill hacker man. However, his apparent death is really good, since he sacrifices himself for Clara, someone he doesn't even know and only met earlier that day. However, he's able to recognise that she has more to lose. There are people she actually knows will miss her because she has those memories intact. Sai doesn't remember any of his loved ones, so he doesn't fear death, which is a really brave move and helps to alleviate some of the lack of characterization, since he at least gets a nice send-off when he seemingly dies. Sai may be a bit underdeveloped, but his teammate Cybra is much more fat 
fascinating and intriguing, with a lot more narrative potential. She's a shapeshifter who in early drafts was actually part of Zygon, although I'm glad they didn't go down that route, because it would have brought up horrific memories of that infamous BBV Zygon movie. If you know, you know. Instead, however, Time Heist takes the much better and less smutty approach of simply having Cybra born of a mutant gene, which causes her to automatically shapeshift into anyone she comes into contact with. Although, come to think of it, we all know what Moffat would have done with a character like this. So I look like from the back. It's fine. I was thinking it was good. Luckily, the episode instead doesn't hide from the true horror of such a premise, because take a moment to really think about it. This is someone who has spent her entire life alone, because she can never experience human touch. It's impossible for Cybra to form genuine relationships, because the people around her become so distrustful, since she looks back at them with their own eyes. On the most basic level, it's just creepy to look at a clone of yourself, but on a further level, it forces you to confront your own guilt by looking at a mirror image of yourself and seeing all the things you've done in your own eyes. There are just a lot of different reasons a power like this would be a curse for everyone involved, especially Cybra herself, who has no choice. She can't just, I don't know, turn it off and enjoy the ability to touch other life forms. Even the memory worm triggers her power, which is downright horrifying. Cybra's backstory is truly depressing born into isolation through no fault of her own. Even her role in the team makes her seem like nothing more than a tool, rather than a living, breathing person. Having such an ability would feel so dehumanizing, similar to Sai's lack of memory. Cybra probably lives in a constant identity crisis because she's so used to being other people. How did you know I was lying? I've had a lot of faces, I find them easy to read. It's interesting how both Psy and Cybra's skills seem like a good thing to begin with, especially the ability to delete unwanted memories, but it soon becomes clear just how much of a curse these things really are. Therefore, it makes a lot of sense that their motivations for taking part in the heist are to find cures such as a circuit so Psy can restore his memories, and a gene suppressant Cybra can use to cure her mutation and live like a normal person for the first time in her life. Both characters begin in the narrative hardened and closed off because of their experiences and difficulties building trust, because they've lost so much. However, throughout the narrative, they brighten up and open up a lot more, especially Cybra who feels like she belongs for once. The Doctor and Clara see her without judgement or prejudice, which culminates in a really nice ending as she's able to hug the Doctor without changing. This finally grants her that wish for regular human touch and interaction. It's a beautiful side story within the episode, although it is a bit of a shame that Sai doesn't get his own version of this payoff, especially because he was part of the story for longer, since Cybra died much earlier on. There's no touching moment where he gets to reunite or even remember the loved ones he'd forgotten about for so long. He doesn't even mention that he's able to remember them, which is a big missed opportunity in my opinion. This lack of a conclusion to his personal work just makes Sai feel a bit too generic and forgettable, ironically, because his role in the story ends up so negligible and like an afterthought, whereas Cybra gets a much more significant and satisfying character journey. Her arc even ties into the Doctor's own series eight arc since she mentions him being a good man, which is a nice way to continue that running theme. Speaking of the Doctor, Peter Capaldi continues his excellent run of form as his 12th Doctor easily takes charge of this ragtag heist crew. Still don't understand why you're in charge. Basically, it's the eyebrows. Unlike the previous episodes, he's very clearly the lead, compared to Clara in the past four stories. Previously, Clara was the focus as we saw the Doctor crashing in and out of her life. However, this time, we start and end the episode with 12 himself, as he tries to wrap his head around Clara preferring her home life and dates with Danny, over seeing wonders like the Satanic Nebula or the Lagoon of Lost Stars. She won't even go to Brighton with him, and you can see how bored he is as a result. Hell, even at the end, he takes a jab at being more interesting than Clara's home life. Robbing a bank, robbing a whole bank. Be that for a dick. It's nice to shift this spotlight back onto the Doctor as the central narrative figure, allowing for his own characteristics to propel the episode forward. He lacks the adventurous chirpiness of his two predecessors, who would probably treat the whole thing like some kind of school trip, constantly cracking light-hearted jokes and enjoying themselves. However, with 12, there's a grim determination to get the job done and solve the mystery. What Sabre is dead, we are alive. Prioritise if you want to stay that way. 
There remains that hardness and bitterness within the character, and I love Sai's observation of the Doctor's name meaning he has professional detachment, explaining that coldness he's displayed towards other supporting characters when they're in danger, compared to how he reacts towards Clara's danger. This kind of coldness and calculation is also present in the fantastic moment of him keeping the team together in one of the bank rooms. Rather than giving some huge inspirational speech to motivate his crew, he just keeps it honest and simple. They all know they wouldn't have agreed to this and the mind wipes without carefully considering all of the risks. So even if they can't remember why they're here, they know a vague picture of what it would take to convince them to take this plunge. So it's a very 12th Doctor way of keeping them all together and push on despite how dangerous the mission is. You agreed to rob the most impregnable bank in history. You must have had a very good reason. Indeed, when they arrive at the bank of Carabraxos, the protagonists spot head of security, Mrs. Delfox. Emphasis on the fox, by the way. And her pet alien, the Teller. This hulking alien immediately looks like it walked right off the set of Star Wars because of how weird and well, alien it looks. It's immediately a striking visual of its straitjacket spacesuit, and it leaves an impression right from the get-go because it's more of a practical monster rather than being realised by a lot of CGI. This gives its movements a lot more weight as it stomps along threateningly, and the score during this part of the episode is almost reminiscent of a western movie, given the impression of the sheriff stomping into town or, you know, something along those lines, because he's the lawman of the episode. The teller is so imposing, and the camera work uses a lot of trickery of how he's presented, rarely ever showing the creature in its entirety, to further build it up as this almost mythological monster we can only see glimpses of, you know, the head or, you know, parts of the body here and there. And the teller's abilities more than match his terrifying appearance, because he can read minds and detect guilt, making him the perfect security measure for a bank like this. Even briefly considering robbing the place will get your brain melted and your skull deflated, which, yeah, is a horrific visual that probably scared a lot of kids. This is a very good premise for a Doctor Who monster, and it kind of reminds me of Minority Report, this instant punishment for even considering committing a crime. It's very dystopian, especially when we later see the victims of the Teller forced into this living hell, looking like Tyler One, and it's almost like they've been given a lobotomy chained up in cells for the viewing pleasure of Miss Delfox. This fate is genuinely disturbing and lends a big sense of threat because it raises the stakes for the main characters, explaining their need to wipe their memories before the heist had even begun. The more we know about why we're here, the louder our guilt screams. That's why we wiped our memories. We even see Sai and Sabra activate their shredder devices to die in a quicker and less brutal way, further emphasising how badly you want to avoid the teller getting to you and cooking your brain into tasty tomato soup. The teller is a scary upfront threat, but the real villain of the piece is Keely Hawes' Miss Delfox. This character was directly inspired by Zachary Garber from the Taken of Pelham 123, and Keely Hawes lends a fantastic feeling of calm sadism to Delfox. Intruders are most welcome. They remind us that the bank is impregnable. She never shows any real sense of panic or stress because she knows the power of the teller and the fortress-like nature of the bank itself. In fact, it's almost like she enjoys the chance to punish people and turn their brains into soup. She's symbolic of how the episode rallies against corporate greed, since Miss Delfox does all of this without any remorse or even guilt, which is ironic given that the teller's ability is to detect guilt, yet he never targets Delfox herself for how evil she is, because she has no guilt for it. Doctor Who is no stranger to political issues, despite what some people would have you believe these days. Oh my god, Doctor Who's so woke now. There are a lot of episodes which serve as socio-political commentary and Time Heist is no different, with Del Fox and Madame Carabraxos as these very corporate villains with a callous disregard for people, and instead only seeing them as customers with lots and lots of money. Del Fox does all of these evil and heartless things with a big smile on her face, which is kind of what a lot of bankers and CEOs do, feeling above everyone else and manipulating the peasants below them. Del Fox even channels her in a Ted DiBiase at one point. Oh, everything has a price tag, I think you'll find. <laughs> For the majority of the episode, there's something very familiar and generic about Miss Delfox, almost like the average campy corporate Doctor Who villain we know and expect. However, this all changes with the great twist reveal of Delfox being a clone of Madame Carabraxos herself, 
also played by Keely Hawes. I adore this turn of events, it's absolutely fascinating. This idea that every important person in the bank is just a replica of the owner herself, since she doesn't trust anyone else to do the job well enough, because yeah, ego goes a very long way. Indeed, it adds a somewhat sympathetic sense of resignation to Miss Del Fox, showing that she's not really trying to be evil, that's just how she was created and it's her purpose to be, because she's nothing more than a reflection of her owner. If you don't like her boss, why stay? My face fits. Sure, she enjoys being evil, but it's still not really a conscious choice she makes. Madame Carabraxos, however, does choose to be evil. She does it because she enjoys it. I really enjoy how Hawes dials up the campiness for Carabraxos herself, creating a nice distinction between the two, showing that difference in their approach to being evil. Delphox almost does it out of a need to survive, since clones who don't perform to the high standards are brutally incinerated, literally fired. But Carabraxos just finds it fun to be this sadistic and evil, because she can get away with it. My clone. And yet she doesn't even protest. Pay a limitation, really. She barely even takes anything seriously, not even slightly phased by the Doctor's threats, because she feels untouchable. It's a fascinating if underexplored aspect of this episode, this clone workforce. It brings up the idea of free will and identity, since the clones don't have much agency and the original sees them as mere tools she can disregard whenever, regardless of how real an individual they themselves feel. It adds further ruthlessness to Carabraxos and introduces some more layers to the episode itself. I mean, it could be the foundation for an entire story on its own, but it's instead one of the many twists and turns of Time Heist, which helps to make it stand out and feel unique. But it's not just there to be flashy, it's vital for the very narrative itself. The Doctor and the two Carabraxoses have really great hero versus villain chemistry, with the laissez-faire attitude of Madame Carabraxos perfectly complementing the Doctor's great anger and furious eyebrows. Shut up, just shut up, shut up, shut up, shut it up, up, up. Yeah, very Malcolm Tucker. There's always a bit of a trope in heist media where the protagonists seem to be at a dead end or backed up against the wall after being outplayed by their marks. It's that moment where all seems lost, only for a flashy montage to reveal that the protagonists were always a step ahead and had set everything up so perfectly even the viewer ends up fooled. It was something the show Hustle perfected more than any other piece of heist media, managing to trick you every time with its final twist at the last minute. Time Heist has its own variation on this, as Sai and Sabra show up to save the Doctor and Clara, having actually teleported to an orbiting ship rather than dying. I do like how even after getting their rewards, these two characters choose to stay and help the Doctor and Clara rather than just leaving them to do the rest themselves. It shows how they've built up a sense of camaraderie, and of course, the even bigger twist comes in the private vault, where the Doctor manages to piece it all together and reveals that he was the architect the whole time. It's a twist I'm sure a lot of people love to say they saw coming, but it works fantastically and no doubt catches a lot of fans off guard because the answer was staring them in the face the whole time. After all, why would the Doctor agree to work for anyone, let alone this sinister architect who seemingly sends them into this place to die? I love the snappy sequence of him setting everything up. It's a satisfying way of bringing everything full circle, creating this cohesive chain of events. The whole thing fits neatly into a timeline we can understand. The Doctor was able to get the cases into the bank, but the vault itself was a step too far, and he couldn't get the TARDIS in there because of the solar storm which is also the only time the vault can even be broken into, so he has to bring this team together and do it the hard way. The one time the bank is vulnerable is the one time we can't just land. Despite the chaotic setup, there are actually barely any plot holes in Time Heist. It's all very neat and makes sense, so this payoff definitely scratches that heist media itch for a slick montage explaining everything, whilst once again showcasing the incredible directing and editing of the episode. However, even after the reveal, the question remains of why the Doctor would want to break into the Bank of Carabraxos to begin with. It turns out that Madame Carabraxos herself summoned him so that she could repent for her actions, and I do wish we had a little bit longer with the character to truly justify this change of heart, since we only get that single scene of a very over-the-top and unapologetically evil Carabraxos. The urge to repent does feel a little bit undeserved, but I suppose it is a common human trait to feel repentance and regret when you're on your deathbed, so I'll let it pass. 
I love the reveal that the Doctor's prize is the salvation of the Teller and the only other member of his species. This is another way of showing you that underneath his brash and often mean-spirited exterior, this is still the same Doctor we know and love, a hero determined to protect the weak and innocent at any costs. He may go about these goals in different ways now, but that just adds more interesting layers to the Doctor. The turn of events also changes everything we thought we knew about the Teller, revealing that he's just a reluctant killer, a slave almost. It's clever that the clues were always there from the beginning, from the straitjacket to the chains and cattle prods. Writer Stephen Thompson left these hints in throughout, but misdirected us by making us fear the Teller, something so wordlessly brutal and alien. I know it's cliche for a Doctor Who monster to end up not actually being a true villain, but it works so well here because of how much the episode had led us to believe that the Teller is a threat and something to be feared without nuance. However, the Templar simply does all of this because Madame Carabraxos has that only other member of his species locked up in a private vault as a bargaining chip of sorts. Carabraxos has a mental link with the Teller, so he knows what she's dangling over him and there's nothing he can do about it, which is deeply tragic and makes you feel really bad for the creature. It reminds me of the Minotaur from the God Complex, this alien almost forced into becoming a monster and killing people because it has to, not because it wants to. This reveal of the Teller's mate is the final piece in the grand puzzle, unveiling the entire point of the heist which is actually a rescue mission for this entire species. The Doctor has no need for money or material possessions, so why else would they decide to rob a bank? No incarnation of the Doctor would just stand by and allow the last two members of a species to die in the solar storm which destroys the bank. The post-Time War incarnations would be especially determined to save the two aliens because of that background of being the last of the Time Lords. Twelve would understand more than any other the loneliness that the Teller is feeling. I suppose it kind of shows that the theme of the episode is loneliness. Sai and Sabra are forced to live lonely lives because of their curses. The Doctor is lonely as the last of the Time Lords, especially when he's travelling without his platonic soulmate Clara, and hell, you could even say Madame Carabraxos is lonely, as she lives in her private vault surrounded by this material wealth as her paranoia and perfectionism forces her to make clones to work for her. Loneliness is a core component of the episode, so it's really lovely to see the two aliens finally being able to live in peace on another planet, away from this subservience and the literal mental anguish of such a busy planet with constant forced victims. It's a truly happy ending without any kind of asterisks, which is nice for Doctor Who every now and then. Solitude is the only peace. Time Heist is definitely one of the most underrated episodes of the entire Stephen Moffat era. It's a delightfully punchy and twist-filled love letter to the heist genre. It's an entire movie condensed into this smooth and stylish standalone episode, and I love it so much. The middle act does sag a little bit, since the best part of these narratives are always the beginning and the end. But Time Heist uses its characters and the mystery to keep that middle aspect interesting. It's one of those episodes with everything you want and expect from Doctor Who. We get the wonderfully camp villains of Miss Delphox and Madame Carabraxos. We get a sinister and strange looking alien monster, great side characters, and it's all tied together by slick writing, directing, and a great varied score by Murray Gold. Peter Capaldi continues to show why he's the best Doctor of all time with another flawless performance, and Jenna Coleman's Clara once again proves to be the perfect foil, even if she does take a bit of a backseat this time around. Time Heist gets a high B rank on the Series 8 tier list. It's definitely not as good as something like Into the Dalek, so it doesn't squeak into the A tier, but it has enough oomph going for it to put it a notch above the largely novelty-driven robot of Sherwood. There are a lot of fun concepts in this episode, with brilliant acting all around and a tight heist plot. It taps into the wider Doctor universe in a great way, with lots of excellent twists and turns, although I do wish Sai was given a bit more of a focus since he feels like a spare part, and Madame Carabraxos could have been fleshed out a bit more too, since her redemption doesn't exactly feel earned. The twist with the teller is great in isolation, but it comes after a few too many similar reveals. So I do think Time High's ceiling is a respectable B rank. But what do you think? As always, let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time. And a special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman and Nick's Games, and my Gold level patrons, Boots, Calvin, Daniel Shillito, Franz Horn AK Line Vortex, Herner Verzog, 
and Tom Azar, thank you so much for your support. 